I am Melanie Patrick Neely, Chief Administrative Law Judge with the Illinois Department of Revenue. And today I'm gonna discuss the Office of Administrative Hearings and how um, the Office of Administrative Hearings actually works to assist taxpayers um, with their issues that they're having with their tax liabilities, no matter what those are. Um, we obviously offer the opportunity for taxpayer to protest, but we hope that that is not the first um, resort and rather it is the last resort if they are unable to work out their tax dispute with their um, program area and that like specifically collections in the case that Michael discussed. Um, and then if they are not, we offer that next opportunity to protest. Um, next slide, please. So let's start with what is an administrative hearing. I think for a lot of taxpayers um, who are not um, involved with the tax uh, process, they are just unaware of an administrative hearing being a process to um, protest your disputes here at the Illinois Department of Revenue. So a administrative hearing is a, a quasi legal judicial proceeding. And um, like any other hearing, it is conducted in, uh, in accordance with the applicable law. In this case, the rules, administrative rules of procedure that are adopted by the Illinois Department of Revenue and the corresponding statutory guidelines. The um, Office of Administrative Hearings is presided over, the Office of Administrative Hearings obviously is overseen by myself and we have um, five judges, five administrative law judges who are responsible to hear cases that come before the Office of Administrative Hearings. All phases of the proceedings up to and including the administrative hearing are indeed presided over by the administrative law judge in accordance with those rules. And I wanna stress that one of the things that I believe is so important and maybe unique to um, the Illinois Department of Revenue is that we first work in collaboration with one another as a team. So our various program areas talk, we, we collaborate and we wanna make sure we share information so that we know what one another is doing um, with respect to the cases that come through the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, we also think, I pride myself in making sure that all of our hearings are overseen in a fair and equi equitable way so that everybody is given a fair shake. Everybody is given an opportunity to be heard and we're doing that in alignment with equity and our DEIA initiative. So everything is done in that, in that way. The practice and procedure for hearings um, obviously is governed, like I said, by the administrative code. Um, and we make sure that we are in alignment with all of the relevant and applicable statutes. Next slide, please. But it's very important to also understand, and I can't stress this enough, that in addition to our mission, which I just stated, um, being that we are making sure that these hearings are conducted timely, fairly, and equitably, um, but we're making sure that our judges are also neutral um, triers of fact, so that they are hearing all of the cases that come through um, without bias and without any sort of um, prior engagement on the case, so that they know that they are getting um, a completely fair opportunity to give to have the taxpayers have a fair opportunity to be heard. As far as how the judges are assigned, I think that's important to know as well. Um, as the uh, chief administrative law judge, I make sure that each time a, a protest is made, and we'll discuss a little bit about that process shortly, um, I then assign a judge once the, the case is, comes in is, and is docketed. How do I assign that judge? It's very, very um, random, meaning I'm giving judges cases as they come in. I'm not particularly looking for one judge to handle a case versus another. And again, I think that goes to the very important mission of the Department of Revenue to ensure that those cases are fairly and equitably heard by judges who have no prior involvement and engagement with the case. Next slide, please. So what types of cases are heard by the Illinois Department of Revenue Administrative Law Judges? Well, this is important because I think there's also confusion around what types of cases can be protested. And I guess when, let me start with this. Tax liabilities are protested. A case is actually created once there is a protest that's filed. And pursuant to statute, which we are of course bound by, 
the Illinois Department of Revenue's jurisdiction is limited only to protests of final notices of tax li liability issued to the taxpayer. I'm emphasizing final because I believe taxpayers often get notices in the mail, and it's very, very common that they believe might be protestable and that they're not. So all notices that you receive, all letters that you receive from the Department of Revenue are not final notices of tax liability, which means they cannot be protested until they become final. These include, and, and I'm just giving you um, the, the main ones, the ones that we see most often, um, the ones that typically result in protests, um, notices of deficiency, um, penalty notices of tax liability, notices of penalty liability and personal penalty liability and notices of claim denial. And each of these, you know, is going to be very unique and specific typically to that taxpayer, depending on what their circumstances are. What are most common are notices of deficiency, which is income tax generally, um, where there is a deficiency that tax has not been paid in its entirety. Um, and the tax due is due and owing. And the tax liability notices are often sales tax. And so you have a lot of other types of tax liabilities, but you also have other opportunities to protest based on things such as certificate of registration, um, which Mike, Michael Sanchez just discussed. And those are also situations where the certificate of registration den is denied, and then a taxpayer is able to protest. So there's a number of different ways. Um, property tax exemptions are also um, protestable. So there is a whole separate way in which property taxes can be protested as well, and exemptions specifically. Sales tax exemptions, um, those can also, denials can also be protested. So the, the key being there has to be jurisdiction and that has to be done after there is a final tax liability assessed to the taxpayer and those can be protested. Again, the other statutory requirement is that the controversy in question is $15,000 um, or less. So if there's anything that any tax liability that exceeds $15,000, it cannot be protested with the Department of Revenue. Rather, those liabilities are protested with the tax tribunal, the Illinois tax tribunal. And I'll discuss that in a, just shortly as well. Um, protests that are registration denials, I just mentioned that certificate of registration denials, those are limited to IDOR jurisdiction. So because of the nature of that particular protest pursuant to um, the rules, those have to be protested only with the Department of Revenue. And again, so when in doubt, there may be questions that you that arise where you're wondering, is this a protestable tax liability? You will have a way to contact the um, Office of Administrative Hearings to get clarity on that, and we will provide those numbers a little bit later. Next slide, please. So when we talk about what type of cases um, uh, that are heard by the administrative law judges, they're very much broadly classified, but I can tell you they're either going to be limited to cases that arise with the Department of Revenue or externally with the Illinois Gaming Board, Illinois Lottery, and Illinois Racing Board. Those are the only, those are the three agencies that we handle externally. Otherwise, all of the cases will arise in the Department of Revenue. Next slide, please. Um, and I should say when they arise from the Illinois Gaming Board, Racing Board, or Lottery, those will be protested directly with that particular agency. And then we assign the administrative law judges to hear those. Additionally, retailers' occupational tax and licensed revocation cases also would be similarly handled within the Department of Revenue, Illinois, I'm sorry, Office of Administrative Hearings and they're governed by the rules that control those particular um, proceedings. Next slide, please. So most importantly, are there cases that administrative hearings does not hear? Absolutely. Um, and Rebecca Kulikowskis will be talking about the Board of Appeals jurisdiction, but I will just summarize cases that fall under the jurisdiction of the Board of Appeals are offers and of comprom offers and compromise, Request for penalty or interest relief based on reasonable cause, 
and cases where, again, I mentioned tax liability um, exceeds $15,000, excluding penalty and interest. So that's important, excluding penalty and interest. So all of those cases that I just sort of broadly described would not fall under the jurisdiction of the Office of Administrative Hearings, but there's a route to having those cases um, evaluated and those protests made as well through the, um, specifically those first two through the Board of Appeals. And again, the Illinois tra Tax Tribunal, which I mentioned, is going to hear cases that um, involve controversies over exceeding $15,000. Those have to be petitioned with the Illinois Independent Tax Tribunal, and those are also made in accordance with the applicable statutes governing, statute governing um, the Tax Tribunal, which is a separate form, completely separate from the Office of Administrative Hearings. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to note that protests must be um, protests and requests for hearings, and I'm going to use those interchangeably because a protest and a request for hearing is essentially the same thing. Um, they also have to be made in accordance with the statutory de guidelines and deadlines. Those statutory deadlines are in the notices that you will receive that as a taxpayer, and those would be, again, the final notices. They will give you the protest rights, meaning set out exactly what your rights are, and more importantly, your deadlines. And the deadlines are so important because often taxpayers will just miss those deadlines, sometimes ignore those deadlines, and then they are forced, unfortunately, to evaluate whether they need to file a late discretionary hearing request. And so only late discretionary hearing requests are the methods to get into the Office of Administrative Hearings and have your case heard once you have exceeded a deadline. Now, we call them LDHs for short. I am the only person as the Chief Administrative Law Judge who has the statutory authority to grant a late discretionary hearing. What does that mean? It just basically means I have to evaluate whether there is the possibility of merit to a case that you now are asking to have a hearing for. I um, also have to understand why did you miss the deadline? So that has to be explained as well. And so there are very specific um, guidelines by which I am able to grant or deny in cases a late discretionary hearing. But that would be the only way that a protest can be made after it exceeds the statutory deadline. And my authority to do so is, um, step, is actually um, included in the administrative code. And I have to uh, strictly abide by those guidelines for granting a late discretionary hearing. Next slide, please. So this is important, the, the manner in which you can request an administrative hearing. Again, Another, um, I think, somewhat confusing and, and maybe unclear way um, to, to figure out how to actually file. I think that the, the, let me start with this. The preferred method and the one that I will emphasize gets your, your uh, protest to the right individuals to be able to be processed, reviewed, and docketed, if appropriate, is the electronic mail method. And that is through the rev.admin hearings at illinois.gov um, mailbox. That is a email box that comes directly to our office. And my staff is completely regularly and, and consistently reviewing that particular um, inbox to make sure that they're taking any protests, re pro requests for hearing, and processing them immediately. We strongly encourage taxpayers to do so and make sure that they are doing so um, with all the necessary information. We also accept um, mail copies of all with required documents to the Illinois Department of Revenue Administrative Hearings Office, which is located at 101 West Jefferson Street. And our address is listed um, on your screen and, on, and it will be available to you later. The hand delivery option, Equally as I think important to, to know that, yes, you will get immediate consideration bringing a, your request for hearing to the Springfield or Chicago 555 West Monroe office. However, if you email it, it's going to get there immediately. You'll have a record that you sent it. We'll have a record of it immediately, and you don't have any issues with um, lost mail. Next slide, please. 
Now, after we receive the protest and all relevant documents, and, and if there's any question about what are the relevant documents, what do we need to process your request for hearing, please, by all means, send an email to that same email I just listed and or call our office, which I will we'll provide the number, and you will get an immediate answer. There's no reason to speculate. We would want you to have everything at the same time provided. Um, the Office of Administrative Hearings requires a power of attorney to be able to um, actually provide information. So if you are not representing yourself as a taxpayer and you're getting a lawyer, a CPA to represent you, they will need to have that important power of attorney um, on file in order to even communicate with you and process information on your behalf. Um, we will let you know if there's additional documents that are needed if you contact us, but the bottom line is there has to be everything together that we need to be able to set your case for a, um, a hearing. Next slide, please. Um, all protests, so documents, it's very important to know that all protests must be submitted in one of two ways, through our age four form, um, which is for non-income tax, or our EAR 14, which is for income tax. That protest and request for hearing form can be downloaded and available on the IDOR webpage. Um, which is listed below at www.tax.illinois.gov. It's very important that the right form be used. And that form will give you all the information you need, what additional information you need to submit. So therefore there will be nothing that you need to um, consider further. And that form is the best way to present your request for hearing. Um, it should also be included. Um, the notice should also be included um, to make sure that you are actually appropriately requesting a hearing at that time and that it's not premature. Next slide, please. And then once the case is open, what documents do I need to submit and what has to happen after you submit those documents? Well, that's the important next step. You're, after everything is, is included, we, the case is docketed, the case is opened, then an initial status conference is scheduled. So a hearing is not the first step. The hearing would be actually the last step in the process should your case not resolve. So an initial status conference will be scheduled. You would be notified. Um, there will be a litigator assigned, and which is an attorney who represents the Department of Revenue's interest. A judge will also be assigned. But once you have the initial status conference notice, which you will see receive in the mail on the first, usually the first um, initial status conference is sent via mail. And then subsequently we would be sending documents and notices via email because obviously that would be the best form of communication. But we wanna make sure that you receive it um, in the first instance. Um, and obviously your tax, your representative, if you have a, a power of attorney um, on file and you have a representative, they will then be the person to contact us, our office and we will communicate with them as well. Um, but again, please note, IDOR does not accept the federal POA form, so we have our form, and our form is also included on the website and it can and also be concluded um, or accessed through the link. Next slide, please. So once the case is opened, what happens? Well, I will summarize this briefly. The Once the case is opened, once you are receiving your notice, and then the docket number is assigned, then that case is going to progress through to a conclusion to a resolution, what we also call a disposition. And after the, the case is heard, there's going to be an evaluation very early on with the litigator to determine whether or not the case can be settled. So if your case is resolved, and it may be, in many of our cases, I should say, are very much, um, we try to, they're, they're resolved. We, the judges are there to hear your case should it actually go to a meritorious hearing. But if, there, if the case is resolved, it's often in the taxpayer's benefit and best interest to have that resolution early. If it does not get resolved, it will go to a full hearing and then the judge will be evaluating whether or not the tax liability should be um, in, indeed enforced and, and paid. And still there can be a possibility of resolution. But that is the process once um, the hearing is scheduled. Our, our, our hearings, or I should say our status conferences, often take place via phone, telephonic, con telephonic conference, and WebEx. So you're not coming into the office very often, unless you really want to and you request it, and then the um, judges and the litigators will accommodate that request. 
Next slide, please. So basically, I already spoke to this. Um, litigated cases often are handled and resolved through settlement and agreement of the parties. That is in no way um, taking away a taxpayer's opportunity to be heard. It is just the most efficient and usually the most beneficial way to get the case resolved in for all parties, all parties involved. Next slide, please. So finally, a recommendation for disposition. Once a case is resolved through a meritorious hearing, and that means evidence is presented, that means that the judge is making an actual determination after the full evidentiary hearing is, is conducted. And sometimes those hearings are actually conducted on by briefs through in writing. And that's a determination that the lawyers are often making um, or the taxpayers making in their because it's in their best interest to do so. A recommendation for disposition is issued by that judge. That judge, once that recommendation is issued, um, that is the, the conclusion of the case, but there is an opportunity to be to have that um, recommendation once it's approved by the director and the director of revenue has to approve all recommendations for disposition. Once that is done, there are appeal rights. So the, the bottom line is you're always going to have an opportunity as a taxpayer to appeal a decision um, once it reaches that recommendation um, for disposition stage. And again, Please contact our office if you have any questions about this process or you need further guidance. 